In the last video, we explained how expectation maximization works to fit a Gaussian mixture model. We took a pretty informal approach and appealed to intuition for most of the decisions we made. This is most helpful to get a comfortable understanding of the algorithm, but as it happens, we can actually derive all of these steps formally as approximations to the maximum likelihood estimator for the GMM model. So what do we get out of this, since we already have the EM algorithm and it seems to work pretty well? Well, first, it will help us to prove that EM converges to a local optimum. Second, we can derive the responsibilities and the weighted mean and variance as the correct solutions. In the last video, if we had come up with five other ways of doing it that also seemed pretty intuitive, we would have had to implement and test all of them to see which worked best. With a little more theory, we can save ourselves the experimentation. This is a good principle to remember. The better your grasp of theory, the smaller your search space. And finally, the decomposition we will use here will help us in other settings as well, starting next week when we will apply the principle to deep neural networks. Let's start by going back to the objective that we actually want to solve, the maximum likelihood objective. At the top left, we see it in general terms, and in the bottom right, we see it written out for the Gaussian mixture model. And we note here again that the reason we're in trouble is that there is a sum inside of our logarithm. And the root of the problem, as we saw before, is the hidden or latent variable. The fact that we have to estimate both the parameters of the components and the responsibilities of each component for each instance together is what makes this a challenging problem. Our first step is to assume some arbitrary function which gives us a distribution on z for x. This could be a very accurate distribution, which gives us just the right distribution on the components for x, or a terrible one. We'll first work out some properties that hold for any q, good or bad. Since in our specific example z can take one of k values, you should think of q of z given x as a categorical distribution over the components in our model. For a particular x, it tells us which components are most likely. This is the same function, this is the same kind of function as the responsibilities we defined earlier, and indeed we will see that q will become the responsibilities later. But right now we are making no assumptions about how q is computed, and we're just saying that it could be a completely arbitrary and entirely incorrect function. We will think of it as an approximation to the probability on z given x and theta, the conditional distribution on the latent space. It could be a good approximation, or it could be a bad approximation. Now, as we saw in the previous slide, given some theta, we can actually compute this function pz. So why introduce an approximation to a function that we can already compute? Because since q can be any function, that means it's not tied to a particular value of theta. q is not a function of theta, which means that in our optimization, it functions as a constant. Now, with this q in hand, we can write out the following decomposition. We can show that the likelihood px given theta, which we cannot easily optimize for, decomposes into two terms, a function L of q and theta, and a KL divergence between q and the function it approximates. We met the KL divergence before in lecture 5. We saw then that it is the distance between two probability distributions. It tells us how good an approximation q is for the distribution p of z given x and theta. And the worse the approximation, the greater the KL divergence. L is just a relatively arbitrary function. There isn't much meaning that can be divined from its definition. But we can prove that when we rewrite the log likelihood of x into the KL divergence between p and q, L is what is left over. L plus that KL divergence makes the log likelihood. This means that when q is a perfect approximation and the KL divergence becomes zero, L is equal to the likelihood. And the worse the approximation, the lower L is, since the KL divergence is always zero or greater. In our current case, z is just a scalar, but we'll treat it as a bold phase vector to highlight that in general, this decomposition holds for any kind of latent variable. We will need that when we reuse this decomposition in later lectures. Here is the proof that the decomposition holds. It's easiest to work backwards. We simply fill in our statement of the L and KL terms. Here in orange, we see the definition of the L function from the previous slide. 
and the definition of the KL divergence from lecture 5. Now note in both cases that we are summing over all values of z, and each term is multiplied, and each term is multiplied by a probability over z. This means that both of these terms are expectations. In both terms, we can work the denominator out of the logarithm and out of the expectation, where they cancel out against each other, which means that the denominators disappear. We can combine these two expectations into a single expectation and combine one logarithm subtracted from another logarithm into the logarithm of a fraction. And we can then factor out the joint distribution on x and z in orange into the product of the conditional distribution of z on x times the marginal distribution on x, which gives us the same factor in the numerator and the denominator. So cancelling those out leaves us with the expectation under q over the log likelihood. And since q is a distribution on z, we're taking the expectation over a constant, which is actually just the value of that constant. So what we have shown is that if we introduce an arbitrary distribution q on our latent space, our log likelihood on x decomposes into these two terms. And this is the picture that all of this rewriting buys us. We have the probability of our data under the optimal model, which we'll call theta hat, and the probability of our data under our current model, which we'll call theta. Now for any q, whether it's any good or not, the latter is always composed of two terms, the L function and the KL divergence. If we choose Q poorly, then the KL divergence constitutes most of the sum. If we choose a good Q, then the L function takes most of the sum. And if we choose Q optimally to be equal to the actual distribution on the hidden variable, the KL divergence is zero and the L function is equal to the likelihood. One way of thinking about this is that L is a lower bound of the log likelihood that we're actually interested in, and the KL term tells us how good of a lower bound this is. We can now redefine our EM algorithm. In the expectation step, we choose Q, and we choose it to minimize the KL term, keeping the parameters of our model fixed. And in the maximization step, we choose theta to maximize the L term, keeping Q fixed. Here's what that looks like in detail. Let's say we have some arbitrary theta, and we have some arbitrary q, which gives us some decomposition of the log likelihood of this particular model. Then in the expectation step, we recompute q so that the KL divergence is equal to zero, which means that for this new q, the L function constitutes all of the log likelihood. Now we know that the KL divergence of q and p is zero if and only if q equals p. So we can compute this step very easily by simply computing the distribution on z given x and theta and setting the distribution q equal to that value. And we already worked out in the previous video what that distribution is. So now we are setting q to be equal to the responsibilities just as we worked them out in the previous video. We then move to the maximization step where we recompute theta, keeping q fixed. Since we're maximizing theta, we can expect L to either get bigger or stay the same size. And since we've changed theta, the KL divergence between Q and P also moves away from zero because our Q was computed in reference to the old theta. Putting this together, we can see that in the maximization step, the total log likelihood increases. And from this, we can see that the algorithm converges. The E step keeps the total length of the bar, the log likelihood, the same, and the M step increases it. In other words, the algorithm can only move uphill on the surface of log likelihood. There's no guarantee that it'll find the global optimum, but we know that it will converge to something. So let's look at what this maximization step looks like, specifically for the one-dimensional Gaussian mixture model. Our job is to find the theta that maximizes this quantity. We can work the denominator out of the logarithm and out of the sum, and since it doesn't contain theta, it doesn't affect where our maximum is. So we are left with this optimization objective, where the function q defines our responsibilities, and the logarithm of px given z is our likelihood. If we take this criterion and fill in what we know about the Gaussian mixture model, 
we get this by filling in the value of theta and the definition of our likelihood. And as we noted before, Q simply corresponds to the responsibilities that we work out in the M step. We can now look at the optimization for each of these parameters in isolation. So let's start with one of the means, specifically the mean for the second component. In this whole sum, that mean only occurs when k is equal to 2. And if we write out the logarithm, we find that the likelihood of the normal distribution reduces to a weighted maximum over the squared errors, plus a term containing the component weight 2, which doesn't affect the optimum. And at this point, we recognize the simple weighted maximum likelihood estimator for the mean, which we've already worked out in a previous video. And the same principle holds for the covariance matrix sigma, and the same principle holds for the covariance matrix sigma, for which we've, al for which we've already also worked out a weighted maximum likelihood estimator. One thing that we haven't worked out yet is the maximum likelihood estimator of our weights. Now these should sum to 1, so that this part of our optimization is actually a constrained optimization problem, which gives us a good opportunity to practice our Lagrange multipliers. We start by separating the logarithm over the probability density of the normal function and our weight, which gives us these two terms, and the term containing the probability density we can ignore because it doesn't contain our weights, which leaves us with this objective function. Note that we need to leave all of the weights wk in because we need to make sure that we can handle these constraints. With this, we can define an L function, which contains as its parameters the values w1 through wk and one Lagrange multiplier alpha. And the final step is to take the partial derivatives of the L function and set them equal to zero. We'll start by taking the partial derivative with respect to one of the weights, in this case w2. For the left term, we have a sum over k, only one term of which contains w2. Within that term, the sum over x is a constant, and the logarithm of w2 gives us the derivative 1 over w2, and in the right term, we have a constant alpha, and a sum only one term of which contains w2, for which the derivative is 1, so the derivative of that term is simply minus alpha. If we set this equal to 0, and rewrite a little bit, we see that w2 is the sum of the responsibilities claimed by component 2 over all of the instances, divided by some alpha. To work out what this alpha should be, we need to take the derivative of the L function with respect to the Lagrange multiplier alpha, which gives us this, and setting that equal to 0 and rewriting recovers our constraint, as it always does for the Lagrange multipliers. Now this doesn't tell us anything directly about alpha, but what we can do is take the equation on the left for all of our weights wk and fill it into the equation on the right. That gives us this, and if we move 1 over alpha out of the sum over k and multiply both sides by alpha, we see that alpha is equal to the sum over all the responsibilities over all components and all instances in the data. We fill this definition of alpha back into the equation on the left, and we see that the weight for the second component is indeed, as we'd guessed in the last video, the proportion of the total responsibility claimed by the second component. And with that, we have rigorously derived the estimators to be used in the maximization step. For now, we'll leave the business of hidden variable models and alternating optimization. But in the next lecture, we'll look at how to apply some of these ideas in a deep learning setting. In the final video of this lecture, we will return to the question of social impact and apply some of the principles we've learned about probability.